Thanks for being here. Yeah, definitely. It's an honor. Yeah. So tell us about Nisolo. Solo. All right. Uh, first off, when I finish up, I'm, I'm expecting those of you that didn't stand up to give me the standing ovation. It was guaranteed by Jeff, and I uh, saw a few people in their seats. Oh, man. So uh, I'd appreciate a... that. I mean, Catherine's a tough act to follow, on. but we'll, well get there. I'd like to introduce Patrick from the <laughs> Solo. Let's hear it right now. Just... Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now sit down. I'm going to have to start calling people out. I appreciate uh-huh. you yeah. saying that. That's good. Man. Some tough acts to follow so far. I'm going to need some encouragement up I here. I know. So, yeah, tell us about Nisolo. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, to kind of understand Nisolo, you have to understand the story of, of how we got started. And um, really, Nisolo's story is kind of the intertwining of a couple people's story. Uh, I'll start with mine and, and, and explain a few other characters and kind of how we got started. Uh, so, in undergraduate school, I studied global economics and business and um, spent all my free time, most of it, I had some fun too, but most of my free, a lot of my free time um, focusing on economic development. I spent a few summers in Uganda, started a nonprofit that uh, supported micro entrepreneurs and, and orphans who've been orphaned by AIDS. I spent um, a lot of time in, in Argentina, a little bit of time in Brazil and Paraguay working with micro entrepreneurs. And all throughout undergraduate school, I kind of gained two passions, one for business um, and kind of studying business, but also economic development. And this was kind of pre everyone knowing what social enterprise is and, and just really found how can I steer my life in the direction of purpose, but using market forces, using business to, um, to, to, to create impact in the world, essentially. And so uh, that brought me eventually to, I also studied Spanish, and eventually got me to northern Peru where at that time, uh, microfinance was somewhat of a, a panacea. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people viewed it that way. Um, but I wanted to get hands-on experience working with women in the developing world, helping them grow their businesses. And I'm going to pause right there and tell another person's story. Another person's story is uh, the gentleman actually in this picture here. His name is uh, Wien or William. And um, William is from the, uh, the, the foothills of the Andes Mountains originally in Peru. And grew up um, humble, humble um, upbringing that eventually had him when he was um, in his mid 20s, headed towards Trujillo, Peru, the third largest city in Peru, um, seeking out uh, a way to provide for his family. His wife with, went, went with him. He had only his shirt on his back. Um, the skill that he brought with him was shoemaking, something that had been handed down to him uh, through generations um, from his father, from um, aunts, I mean uncles and uh, historically in the family. And for about 15 years in Trujillo, uh, William struggled to grow his business. He, he worked with a few other shoemakers. It was an inconsistent market. Basically what's happened is Trujillo, which is the shoemaking capital of Peru, which has been historically been a thriving industry there, has faced global challenges, importing product from India and China, competition. There's over 100,000 people in the supply chain there in footwear. So what was once this thriving industry um, is not that way anymore. And so back to where we met, I'm, um, this is 2010, November of 2010. I'm working with William's wife, Doris, who has a small convenience store inside of her home on the outskirts of Trujillo, Peru, and um, helping her kind of with her books. And I hear all this pounding. And so she says, hey, my husband's a shoemaker. Do you want to meet him? And I'd been in Trujillo for a few months, hadn't, hadn't met, um, seen any shoes, and thought, yeah, of course. So we turned the corner in their home, and her husband's sitting there handcrafting what looks like an Italian dress shoe. Mm-hmm. And uh, the juxtaposition of, of that environment, the home that we were in, the neighborhood that we were in, with the quality of that shoe took me back to experiences I'd had in other parts of the developing world. I'm sure so many of you have had um, right here in, in, our, in our own backyard in, in Atlanta as well, of, um, of, of, of the potential that exists in, in impoverished communities um, and in common denominators, lack of access to capital um, or training or education that, that constantly create this um, unnecessary barrier between growth. And that was definitely William's story. And so I thought, man, I want to do something to help this guy. He's one of the most incredible entrepreneurs, so ambitious that I've I've ever been around, but thought, you know, how could this scale? And I turned to the Peruvian market and saw, wow, there's so much potential for scale here. There's so much potential for impact. The industry's here. The tanneries are here. This is possible. What about the global market? And I shifted my focus and looked at the global market and saw an upward trend um, for footwear and fashion, an upward trend for e-commerce, and thought, man, this is a good opportunity. But I also found out that... Um, the more that I looked into it, that 
it had actually become, at the same time the fashion industry was becoming the most profitable it's ever been, it was becoming the deadliest in terms of people in the supply chain. It was becoming the second most polluted industry in the world. And I thought to myself, man, this is what's wrong with this picture when there are people out there buying products. I mean, how, we don't know where the clothes we're wearing came from or, or how people were treating that supply chain. Um, and a lot of our clothes are, are falling apart months later. And What's wrong with it when you have that, but you also have people like William that have this incredible, that they have a family and a home and people that, there are people behind what we're wearing every day and that, that was something that I, I couldn't live with. And so I was planning to go to grad school, threw the books away and um, essentially decided, you know, I wanna start a brand that, that values the producer just as much as the end consumer. That's and so good. that's what we've um, been busy creating. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> So how would you say Nee Solo is different than the stereotypical shoe company? Definitely, yeah. So, I mean, as I just explained, I mean, big picture, what does the industry look like? You have um, major players, major fashion brands that are out there. They hire an agent to say, hey, go make me this. The agent goes and sources and looks at several different factories and essentially finds how can we find the cheapest way to make this product? Well, guess who's getting squeezed out? The person at the very bottom, the person making the product. And um, I know that firsthand, my co-founder, Zoe, uh, she worked for a multi-billion dollar fashion company in New York, and um, it, she left that because she saw that what was happening in the supply chain, they were not valuing the people at the bottom of the supply chain, margin, it was all about margin, all about margin, versus Nisolo, again, kind of trying to decide, look, let's value producers more than anything else. So we start, essentially, our model is, um, no matter where we produce our products, uh, there are a few mandatory things that have to happen. That's above fair trade wages, healthcare, and uh, safe working conditions. And so as we grow, that will always be true. It's, but apart from that, we decided in order to actually do this effectively, in order to try to um, show consumers as well as the industry this is possible, we decided to vertically integrate. And so we actually, when we started Nisolo, we started two businesses at the same side. At the same time, this side of the business, which is you know, the sales, distribution, e-commerce, all of that. And then we also started the factory from the ground up. And um, within our factory, so that, again, safe working conditions, fair trade wages, above fair trade wages, and um, healthcare. But we also decided what we saw through our impact analysis that we do every six months is that even though our shoemakers' incomes were tripling, from, from working with us, it didn't necessarily mean that they were saving money. And so we wanted to get to the bottom of that. And what's rolled out, the result of that has been that we've really understood the needs of who we're working with and we've adjusted our program accordingly. So we have um, financial literacy training with our shoemakers, with their families. We have um, English training classes as a skill that they, that they felt like could help their children um, you know, have a much better opportunity in the future. Um, we have an in-house micro lending and savings program. So really our, our model is how can we go really deep with producers and value them just as much as the, the consumers that we want to buy the product. Love that, that's amazing. So you've been on this track for how long, five years, four? It'll be five years this October. Five years, and yeah. there's some people in here that are launching projects or they have a friend that's launching a project, mm -hmm. a social enterprise. What advice would you give to people that you've learned in your first five years? Definitely. One of the uh, statistics that I read that inspired me to go for this was I read that 91% of consumers um, will consider changing their brand loyalty if uh, price and quality are held constant and there's a cause associated with it. Uh, I thought, what if we had Can a you cause? Say that? Can you say that Definitely. one more time? So, 91%. Because I have a feeling people want to hear this and think about yeah, it again. So, Essentially, think about what you're wearing right now. If you're wearing clothes, which everyone in here hopefully is, or shoes, you're part of this, uh, what we're talking about right now. And if you could have everything you have on right now, your style, your quality, um, and you knew who made it, you knew it was ethically produced, um, how many of you, and you had it at the same price point, how many of you uh, would consider choosing a brand that actually was ethically sourcing their product? Yes. A lot of us, right? And so, when I saw that, I thought, what if, what if we had a cause baked into our business model, but our product and our price was actually superior? And that's what we've built. Is it, I mean, we have handmade leather shoes, should cost $300, $150 average price point. Um, and that's been hard work figuring out how to make that happen. But, um, but, but your advice is really... The advice is product. product. The advice is, yes, that statistic is true, but it's not true unless you deliver on the product, and as a social entrepreneur, unfortunately, you have your work cut out for you because not only 
you know, are you working in um, maybe developing communities and, and you're working with poverty and things are just much more complicated, you have to compete with the people who are cutting corners. That's a reality that you face. And so make sure from the start or throughout the process, focus on product, focus on brand, focus on marketing. Make sure you're able to compete with the best in the industry. Um, and it's a process. We're not, even, we're not even close to there, but it's something we're focused on. We know we have to be The quality able has to compete, to compete with, the best. with the best, right? Exactly. That's, that's mm -hmm. so good. Um, so talk about the importance of a great team. How do you find and attract these people into it? Definitely. How big is your team right now? So let's see. We have uh, 76 full-time uh, shoemakers actually on our payroll in Peru. We have uh, around 25 people in our U.S. office. In Nashville? As well. Is mm -hmm. that right? In Nashville. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how do you find these people? I mean, how, especially in the developing world, how Definitely. do you get them going? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we started Nisolo with a very small family and friends loan, and it's been cash flow. I mean, just... It's been scrappy from day one. We just started raising our first outside capital, but the only reason we've gotten to where we are has been because of the people who have supported us. So I consider my team, of course, the people on it, but the community around us, our mentors, our advisors. Um, and the reason why we are where we are is because several people on our full-time team have left careers where they were making much more money um, and, and high up in their careers. They left to get paid a lot less because they wanted to align their lives, their passions with, with purpose. And that's, uh, that's been a big part of it for us, is, is recruitment is the first thing. Going, finding people that align with that purpose. Everyone at our team wouldn't be there. If they're so drawn to it, it holds, it holds us accountable to it, but it also motivates us every single day. And then uh, we have an extensive, people are everything. This is, we have an extensive um, recruitment process. We have strength finders, we do print assessments, we do extensive interviews, just because we know the one thing you have to protect is your culture. And when, as um, Ron pointed out, when you have walkers over here and joggers and then the runners, it's, it's a mess. You have to go and, and make sure you're constantly focused on investing in that team. Um, and, and most of our hires have actually come from the networks of our team. So that mm -hmm. focus, good recruitment, focus on culture um, and, and using your team to go and, and find um, the best people is a, is a big piece of it and then purpose behind what you're doing. So I remember the first time we talked, it was interesting. You started just sharing about the people that invested in you along the way. Definitely. And these advisors that mm -hmm. have spoken to this process over the last five years. Talk about how you've done that, the, life, the lifetime of how your advisors have worked. Because I think this is really interesting for people that are just thinking about doing something right now, all the way to the ones that are scaling what mm -hmm, they're doing right mm -hmm. now. Can you share about that timeline? Absolutely. Yeah, so our third core value is mejorarse siempre, which is a Spanish phrase that roughly translates to never stop improving. Um, for every person on the team, that's been, humility has been a really important piece um, that we've recruited for from day one, but because Thankfully, I was forced into humility because I knew nothing about fashion, never thought I was gonna be in it, and from day one, I knew I had to lean on other people. And, um, and that's, um, essentially, I actually forgot the question. What was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about the lifetime yeah, yeah, of right. your okay. advisors. Because right. there was people that helped you that's at the right. beginning, and yeah. it's, it's so, changed over exactly. time. Exactly, so trying to instill that, that value has, from day one and now at scale has been, we know we don't have it figured out. We've, we've learned some things, we have some things to share, but we also have, if we wanna compete, we have tremendous things to learn. So the first thing I actually did when I started Nisolo Solo was I built you know, a, a brief, I think it was like seven or eight page executive summary, here's what I wanna do, and I literally sent it to 100 different people. I was 24 or so at the time, 23, 24, sent it out to um, professors from college, friends, everyone I knew, I actually met my co-founder through a mutual friend and Skyped with her once and decided, she, flew to Peru on a whim and to come give it a shot, but all of it was because I reached out to my entire network. And the reality is if you have purpose behind what you're doing, and so many social entrepreneurs in the room know this, people wanna help. And it, it, you need to let go of, of, you need to be humble and say, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, and be honest, say, hey, I need some help, and that's what we did. And so the beginning stage looked like that, just anything, like making sure my team was calling, okay, you're in charge of sales, go figure out who's doing it at X company. They wanna help. And, and, and learn from them. Um, but that's kind of evolved over time. One thing that's been important to me is making sure to keep those people updated. I am very bad at um, staying up to date with friends. I mean, I've got like 500 unread text messages, right? I'm not good at daily communication and, and, and making sure people are updated. But one thing I've tried to be really disciplined about is every quarter, I have essentially an email list of our brand champions that 
um, have been those people that helped us from day one or maybe just got introduced to it and I send a personal email to them and say, hey, here's the good, bad, and ugly of what's going on. Um, here are my asks, I actually need some help still from you. And what I've started to do, and this has been awesome, I just started this in the last few, trying to provide value for them as well has been big, and that's what I've gotten a lot of feedback on. And literally it was just, hey, here's what our team's reading. This is a must-read book. Here's a must-read article. And the last one even had, I put on there, um, a few Spotify, Spotify playlists, like blues to listen to, or you're throwing a dance party, you gotta have this playlist that just we, we put together. So trying to, to kind of add value to make it a two-way street, and then ultimately it's, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so you started with these 100 people you asked for advice, mm -hmm. and then it came down to a smaller group, right? Right, well, we have the, yeah, the bigger network that on a quarterly basis we're keeping up to date with, but essentially we've started very large in the, in, in the terms of the size of people, and slowly that's morphed into a closer-knit group of advisors. Um, and again, people wanna help you. We have some of the top CEOs from formal footwear companies that wanna help us, that are engaged, that I had one conversation with, they invested, they came to Nashville, flew to spend time with our team. Um, so we've gotten, now we're going much deeper with a tighter knit um, um, group of advisors, which I think is important to go deep with, with, the, with the experts, but stay wide with, everyone in this room can contribute to Nisolo and making sure that people understand that um, and, and can feel a part of the process of what you're building. That's cool. What are the challenges you're having today? And how do you deal with those problems? Yeah. Uh, I, this is how I started our last conversation. I was like, so what are you wrestling with today? He's like, do you really want to talk about this? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. Let's get real, right? Yeah. I think that the root of, of kind of two challenges, key challenges we're facing right now is just um, on the way to scale. Since we started, we've grown um, our revenue and, and pretty much our team by 100 to 150% every single year without adding a bunch of capital. So it's been, like I said, it's been very scrappy. It's been a lot of hard work. Um, but what we're, what we're well, the challenge with that is that if your team doubles, your culture changes immediately. We felt that every year. We used to have everybody in the same room, sitting around the same table. It was so easy to keep everyone aligned. Everyone felt like they were a part of everything. And then we got a little bit bigger and we had to close the door sometimes and talk about really hard stuff with the exec team. And some people didn't like that. And it was, it was hard for them. So the culture is just, you know, constantly is shifting. And so what, what the challenge I'm facing right now is making sure alignment is felt from, um, my VP of Finance and Operations all the way to our, C, you know, our CX associate, making sure they're, they know what are the five things that we're focused on this quarter? And how do those five things, essentially, we, we, if you wanna write this down, check out Objectives and Key Results, OKRs. It's a system that uh, Google uses, Harry's. We got it from our friends at MeUndies, but essentially, you develop five objectives. Every single one of those have to have five key results that have to take place in order for that to take place, for, for that to be achieved for the organization. What we did is said, all right, now let's take that to the departmental level. The departments pull all the key results from those core objectives, and they become their departmental objectives to which they build those key results, and then you do it at the individual level. So it essentially allows one person on the team, no matter if you have 500 people, all the way to the top five objectives, they know exactly how they're contributing to revenue, even though they have nothing to do with it. They know exactly how they're contributing to our impact goals. Um, that's been a big piece, has been alignment. And then as we scale, also just cash flow, <laughs> like any other business, it's, um, we run a, a pretty expensive business because we own the, the manufacturing side of it. But finding banks that believe in us, they don't care that we, investors get so excited when, you, when you're growing your revenue at this pace, but banks, they just wanna see, all right, what's your EBITDA? And when you're purposely breaking even so that you can continue growing, guess who doesn't wanna loan you money? And so you gotta go find the right partners out there that believe and understand what you're doing. Um, and that's been a challenge and something we're facing now is just scaling and um, finding the right, right partners along the way. That's cool. So what does the future of Nisolo look like? Because you've gone beyond shoes now, right? We do, yeah. So, so what is it, where are you headed? Yeah. So now it's footwear, leather accessories as well, men and women. Um, but I think the future, long term for Nisolo, when we talk about vision, our actual vision statement is, is kind of bifold. On one hand, it's a vision for the fashion industry. Um, the lowest, the, the estimates for how many people are employed by the fashion industry range from one in every six people on the planet, so you're talking about a billion or more, and the lowest I've heard is around 300 million. You're talking about a big industry. And where is the majority of that? The majority of that is in developing countries where people struggle to make more than a dollar a day. What consumers don't understand is if we paid a few more pennies for the clothing that we wear, what's happening at the bottom of that um, supply chain 
is transformational. It's not a big change that's needed when it comes to the consumer. Um, and, and so our vision for the fashion industry is what would happen if instead of being this um, very ugly industry when you get behind the scenes, what if it were a vehicle for change for these hundreds of millions of people um, that are part of the process? And that's, uh, that's what we hope for, yeah. And then, and then with, with me solo, uh, our hope is to, to lead in that process. We wanna be a part of that. There's so many, we wanna show consumers you can have what you desire in a product and ethically consume it. We've seen that and portray the other brands around us. So um, yeah, we wanna, we wanna be one of the people that, that's fighting for that and making that happen and, and a success story in the space because it's what, it, what it needs right now. One of the things I love about Nice Solo is that the quality is so high. And I think, it, I think you, you said this at the beginning, like if we are gonna compete, we have to compete at the same level exactly. as them. Mm -hmm. So I think you should be commended at that because that is an unusual reality that you guys are doing. I appreciate it. Uh, last question for you. What do you wish someone would have told you when you began? I think uh, it's so cliche, and I'd heard it before, but I wish someone would have just grabbed me and shook me and forced this in, but uh, people really are everything um, to your team. What Ron pointed out again, the walkers, joggers, there's all of that, but you have to get people around you who are just as passionate as you um, and, and, and invest in them. I wish I would have known from day one, people, 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 people. Um, We've learned that the hard way. Now we have an incredible team. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for them. Um, and so that's one thing, is just people, 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 people. And the other is focus. So as, um, you know, in, in my demographic, as Ron pointed out, the type of people in this kind of 25 to 35 age range, we think we can do it all. And, and from day one, I was, we're gonna do wholesale and we're gonna have the best product in the market and we're gonna scale this side of the business and we're gonna scale this side of the business and we're gonna be the best e-commerce and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, oh yeah, and we don't have enough money to do any of that. And the reality is that we need to shut up and focus on what's most important. And I wish someone would have told me, you actually can't do it all. You need to focus on what are the critical, most essential, read Essentialism by George uh, McEwen. It is amazing. But um, focus on what is the most critical thing. And we've, so now we've had a, our team is required every week to spend at least an hour away from their desk only thinking about what's most essential, what they need to be planning for, prioritizing. Um, and I wish someone would have said, focus is everything, you can't do it all. And so we've, you know, now we're, we're a lot more focused than we've ever been, but we had to learn that the hard way along the way. And we would be much further if someone had told me that before. I love it. Aren't you excited about this brand and what Patrick is doing? This thank thank you. you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Right.